Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Keith from the Factory Development Team. Great. Welcome to Primetime at the BU Library. Celebrating learning beyond the classroom, the experiences and accomplishments of the faculty, the students, and staff is what Primetime is all about. It's a collaborative project between the Friends of the BU Library, Campus Ministries, and many other offices on campus. You can find upcoming Primetime events on the library website, news, and events calendar. If you missed the presentation, most are recorded and can be viewed online in our BU Digital Library, also found on the library website homepage. On Thursday, May 1st, Dr. Christina Cleveland, uh, who will be joining the Reconciliation Studies faculty this fall, uh, will share her uh, research on campus climate. As a guest of the Student Life Intercultural Student Programs and uh, Services Office in the Department of Reconciliation Studies. Today, Dr. Jeff Jacob from the Business and Economics Department will present his paper, The Role of Institutions, Openness and Democracy for Economic Growth. Let's welcome Jeff. Thank you, and um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, this is a part of this paper I've been working on in my sabbatical, and it is an offshoot for my dissertation, but uh, the events of the past couple of years has picked my interest in the area of democracy and what role it plays in economic uh, growth. So. You know, we all talk about democracy as being good for growth, and there's a lot of evidence which points one way or the other. Uh, but I was really interested in what role does democracy pay, play by watching the elections in Zimbabwe. You know, Zimbabwe had elections last year, and uh, Mugabe got re-elected. All the international observers said elections were fair uh, because it met all the criteria, but then this was a highly contested election. and. Uh, there was a lot of hue and cry over the validity of those elections, but nothing was done by the African Council or by observers to uh, question the results. And then uh, here we see Mugabe casting his vote, uh, and of course, you know, he has had such a tight grip on the Zimbabwean polity that he got re-elected fairly easily. Now, here's a democracy well, in one of the larger African countries, uh, a successful democracy, so to say, but just yesterday, there were these four headlines from Zimbabwe. Uh, there's already uh, protest going on. There's part of having a coup uh, that needs to be organized against Mugabe. Uh, they are really messed up with the international policy also. They've been taxing foreign tourists a VAT of 15%. Uh, Zimbabwe needs tourism for its economy. And here they are taxing foreign tourism. This is like an anti-trade policy in a way. Uh, they're running huge trade deficits. Uh, they have failed to pay their IMF debt. Uh, and then CSR, or corporate social responsibility, is the big buzzword, where companies want to have a social responsible aspect to their business. Here's a company, a Diamond Mine, which has not been meeting its obligations. They said they will uh, take care of the workers, etc., but they have not been doing that. So even though we have a functioning democracy, every day we are hearing things about uh, things not going well in Zimbabwe, and one wonders whether democracy is enough for economic growth or not. Because I really would expect democracy to promote economic growth, but we're not seeing this here. Uh, more recently, we had uh, elections in Egypt. Uh, we presume that uh, most um, Mubarak was a bad dictator, was suppressing the country, and people's voice was not being heard. Was a very re regressive economy, and we hoped that having democracy would work well in Egypt. So he was overthrown, he's in prison, but what happened next? The one who was elected after him is in prison as well. So here's Mosri, and both of them are now in prison. Mm -hmm. So there's something going on with the way democracy works, and democracy by itself may not signal uh, good economic policies or a path to higher income and economic growth. Uh, in fact, following the revolt in Egypt, David Brooks, I think, mentioned that Egypt doesn't have the mind to have a democratic society. Uh, so just inserting democracies may not be enough. Uh, more recently, we have seen events in Ukraine which have also brought into question the legitimacy of elections that don't really represent people's wealth. You know, this was a circle which was a hub of tourism and then just to few weeks ago it was the hub of protest and revolt and violence. 
So what does the literature tell us about democracy? And as I said earlier, evidence is mixed. Some uh, papers in economics point to weak democracies and they say they don't really work well. And there was a paper by Barrow in 1996, it was an influential paper. In that paper, he looked at democracy and the impact on economic growth in a cross-section of more than 100 countries uh, over a 20-year period. And what he found was that democracy has no effect, and if it has at all a negative effect on economic growth. Mm. But he did find a positive correlation between democracy and human capital formation. So he argued that democracy may impact or improve some outcomes, but not necessarily economic growth as such. Um, then there was another paper by Person and Tabellini, which was pretty influential also. And they looked at the median voter problem. And they said that you know, in a democratic redistribution, if you redistribute wealth in a democratic society, it may impede growth. So they were saying that inequality may actually be good for growth in some ways. And we may not need to have a democratic distribution of resources for economy to grow well. Uh, then March and Olson in an earlier paper had raised the idea that democracy, democracies may lead to political gridlock, but there's too much fighting going on that nothing really gets done. And if you know, we hear our congressmen always say Congress is not working because there's so much bipartisanism, so much fighting going on. But of course, we have a functioning democracy. Think about countries which are not mature enough to handle democracy. There, nothing just really gets done. Um, and then. Tabellini, in a follow-up paper, found no significant impact of democracy and economic growth. So the evidence has been pointing to democracy not being really important or not having an impact on overall growth. On the other hand of the spectrum, we have successful democracies like the US, which have been very successful and have been very prosperous. So a second strand of literature has looked at these countries and has found that democracy actually um, has a positive impact on economic growth. Uh, Roderick and Wachier, I think, they looked at the panel data of countries and they found that recent democracies have been on a higher growth path than when they were other private countries. Uh, then Lazeri and Persico looked at the British elite and sometimes people argue that elites do not want democracy, they want to control their own power. But what they found was that democracy helps keep the politicians in check and helps them enact policies that are conducive to growth. So it enhances competition. So even if there's no threat from disenfranchised people, at least want to have democracy because then they can have more favorable policies. And they based their paper on the evidence of England um, when it was um, working towards democracy. Um, more recently, Bates, Fayad, and Hoffler did an empirical investigation looking at the impact of democracy on growth. So they had just two variables. For the bivariable regression, they had democracy and growth. And they looked at the feedback between the two. And what they found was for Africa, uh, democracy does seem to impact economic growth in a positive way. However, they found the impact to be not uniform. There were some countries which were not doing well, some which were doing well. But they did not have any conclusion as to what may trigger democracies to be good versus bad for economic growth. So it was just a simple um, relationship gap between the two. Um, and then more recently, there was a paper by a sociologist slash political scientist, Robert Woodbury, uh, which found evidence that colonizers, which were Protestant mission-oriented, resulted in establishment of democracy in countries. So he said that mission work led to democratic societies, which led to more economic growth. Uh, it's an interesting paper, and it got a pretty good coverage in Christianity Today just this year. You might have you know, seen that article. It was a cover page. And, uh, in some ways, this article in Christianity Today was arguing that colonization may not have been bad because it led to establishment of democracies through uh, Protestant missions. Next to the democracy is a parallel literature in economics, which is called deep determinants. And economists have been uh, really trying to figure out why some countries grow and others don't. 
and one of my earlier papers was in this literature. Um, we have identified three main determinants of growth. And the approach has been to do a horse race of these three. These three are institutions, trade, and geography, but figure out which one matters more. And as you can see, I've ranked my horses based on what I think are more important <laughs> than the other. So the first one is institutions. And we all know that good, good institutions foster good economic growth by setting the rules of the game which are conducive to competition, uh, better business practices, better absorption of human capital and physical capital, and lowering transaction costs. There's been a lot of research in this area which has shown um, that institutions do matter and they have a significant and strong impact on economic growth. Um, the next, and feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions, otherwise I'll just keep talking, but I'd <laughs> like to pause and answer questions along the way. Um, Talking about educational institutions, Jeff, or all These kinds are of institutions? mainly economic institutions. So there are two ways of looking at economic growth. You know, we know that human capital, which is education, uh, labor and physical capital will impact output. But these will not be enough by themselves. We can have a country with these three things, but if they have bad legislation, bad rules of law, then these things may not trust it with our economic growth. So institutions are in the backdrop that affect how these three education institutions, capital, uh, physical capital, affect economic growth. So the rules of the game and the way people organize themselves. That will have an impact on. So then one of the examples I give my students is if you look at Minneapolis and you look at Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, similar sized cities. Minneapolis was the hub of education. We have nine schools just in the same in one city. We take Minneapolis, put it in Ethiopia, and bring Addis Ababa, bring it in the U.S. Minneapolis will not be the Minneapolis we know now. It will go into chaos. And then these events may start developing just because of the infrastructure and things around it. So institutions are what governs the way these three factors, labor, physical capital, and human capital, affect economic growth. Um, yeah. The second factor that's been found to have a significant impact on growth is trade. Um, it's just not access to goods and services. It is access to ideas, access to new institutions, access to resources, uh, learning from each other. So countries that are integrated well with the world seem to be on a higher growth path. And over the past couple of decades, we've seen an increase in isol isolationist policy. South America wants to do things on their own and stuff. We've seen a stagnating growth in those countries. Uh, and countries have embraced trade um, have typically grown well. And there were a bunch of studies which have established one matters more than the other. And then finally, a lot of recent effort has been focused on the role of geography on economic growth. You can have the good institutions, good policies, but if a country is geographically distant out, it may be landlocked, it may be close to the tropics, it may have a high disease environment. So people are really dealing with survival instead of focusing on long-term investment, long-term growth, uh, and productivity enhancing ventures. So Jeffrey Sachs has been really big on geography, and uh, he has a whole foundation, and he's been raising money, and he thinks that geography is the biggest factor that pulls Africa back, and we need to provide bed nets, provide ways to fight geographic disadvantages, even at the expense of institutions and trade. So what we found in literature has been a horse race of these three. Which one matters more? And people have um, said one or the other. And based on that, they have been proposing policies that favor one or the other. Um, so where does this paper fit in the literature? Um, there was a recent paper by Esmoglu, uh, Johnson, and two other economists which came out just last month. And so it seems that we have been working on similar thing at the same time, and uh, we have different hypotheses. They say it causes growth, I say it may not cause growth. And so I see this as our biggest rival right now. There are two MIT, uh, one year, one four-year professors, and they claim to have the last word on democracy. They say that the 
recent literature has suffered from four big empirical problems. Um, one is measurement of democracy. They say it has not been uh, measured accurately, and they claim they found a measure of democracy which is fairly accurate and robust. Uh, so they may get improvement. Um, secondly, they claim that most papers do not model income dynamics. Today's income depends on past income. So there's a feedback of income levels into future income. And if you don't model that, you may be confounding the effect of democracy on um, economic growth. Because it may be based on past economic growth instead of democracy. So they claim to model that as well. Um, and then the third thing that they point out is that most papers have just taken time averages of countries across time. Uh, and if you take time averages, you have one data point for each country. You may have 100 countries, but you take averages. So you are losing out a lot of information. You're losing out how things take or affect each other over time. So US may have grown differently than South Korea over time. And we need to factor that explicitly. Second thing we need to model is country-specific unobserved traits. We know that US is different than South Korea. Sometimes we can't put a finger on those things. And those things stay the same over time. So if we do cross-section, we get rid of all these cross-country uh, heterogeneities or differences. So this is the model that as well in a panel data say. Um, and then finally, high incomes can cause better democracies too. Right? So there's a feedback from income to democracy. And if you don't model that, then we may again have confounded estimates. Uh, what I do in this paper is also these four things plus more. So it will be a hard time to defend. So when you send a paper, they'll say, have you cited this or read this? Because they are all the established, published uh, economists. But uh, I think that our paper looks at these four issues in a more systematic way plus more. Uh, what more? There was a fairly influential paper in early 2000 by Dollar and Cray. And this paper goes to the three deep determined literature, restriction, trait, and geography. They look at these three to see which of them matters. And they find very little evidence for institutions. They say that trade is what really trumps everything. Uh, geography has no effect. Institutions don't matter. And then they extend that model to include government policies. Um, like government spending, black market premium, which is a measure of trade restrictions, uh, and inflation rate, which captures some macroeconomic policies as well. <coughs> so what they find is that these macroeconomic policies, which we know are important, you know, I mean, they're covered in news almost every day in Wall Street Journal. They talk about inflation, about uh, government spending, about uh, trade restrictions. But they say that these policies don't really matter. And even when we control for those, institutions don't matter. So what I do in this paper is combine the democracy literature with the deep determinist literature and put it all together to see uh, does it what matters more than the other person. Uh, and then instead of looking at democracies as such, there has been a division of economic versus political democracy. Right? So we have new data sets like Freedom House, um, Economic Freedom Index. The World Bank has a bunch of data sets looking at rule of law, government regulation. So economists have been saying that these things matter more than political democracy. Um, and my paper kind of fits in that uh, strand as well. So um, Helmut and Deutsche Liegos did a meta-analysis. What they did was they looked at 84 studies in this area. And they saw what were the conclusions from these studies. What they found was that democracy may not really have an appreciable impact on growth. In fact, they find that democracies may lead to big governments. They may lead to anti-trade policies. And in some ways, they may actually impede growth. Then there was another study that really shook up the whole literature. Most of the studies in democracy and institutions have looked at panel data. And they followed an estimating method called dynamic panel data. I'll talk about that when I look at the model section. Um, Bazzi and Clemens, there are a couple of economists from San Diego. They came up with a paper last year 
which said that a lot of these studies have incorrect um, identification. Identification is, can we really identify causality in our model? Can we really identify the impact of institutions or democracy? Or are we catching something else? And what they find is that a bunch of these studies, they look at four published studies, replicate the results, and then um, devise certain tests to test the validity of those studies. And they find that those studies actually fail those tests. Um, so this paper is kind of now forcing economists to relook the way they do dynamic panel data. So in this paper, I'm careful about this study, and I look at the new test that they have um, prescribed, and I test my model against these tests as well. And I think ours is right now the only paper in this literature which is doing that. So I've looked at Econlet, and uh, so this might be one of the few papers which combines democracy with growth, uh, and also does a decent job empirically to be careful about assumptions and testing of the model. So the main question that we are asking is, we know that uh, institutions, trade, and policy matter for growth. Thus, democracy has an additional role to play when we look at these things. So we're looking at combining all of this literature into this paper. Um, a small group that I cited earlier does not look at the deep determinant. They focus on democracy only. Um, so we are kind of making improvement over their estimation techniques as well. Uh, I think we make three distinct contributions to the existing literature. We are moving it forward by extending the back dollar and craze ITG, or deep determinants, with policy and democracy. So we combine Barrow's paper with Dollar and Cray. Um, secondly, we have better estimation methods than some of the current studies uh, that have come, up, uh, come out. Um, and then our model choices are based on uh, tests to check the validity of models. So we are more careful about the results that we report, and we are making sure that they meet some of the criteria. Uh, so they are fairly robust. To specifications. Uh, how do I measure these variables? We've talked about institutions. Um, there are a bunch of ways to measure institutions. The measure that I mainly use in this paper is called contract intensive one year CIM. Uh, this is a measure of money in the banking system as a ratio of total money supply. And the idea is that if people trust institutions, they're more open to putting the money in formal financial institutions because they know that they can get the money back. Financial markets are working fine, so they can make investments with the money. If they don't, then they will keep the money in gold or in cash or in other illiquid ways. And this measure was developed by a couple of economists in a paper in 1990. And what they did was they did a case study of this measure and other institutional measures in five countries, Iran, um, uh, Korea, Bangladesh, and one of the African countries. And they found that this measure really is fairly robust, and it does capture institutional quality. So I have stuck with this measure as an objective measure, which is not having any measurement error. Um, and so we can look at it in a clearer way. Then um, veto players is the number of veto players in a government. So it looks at checks and balances within a government. Now, a lot of these studies have looked at democracy as a big, broad indicator. What I'm trying to talk about is that maybe we need to look at fine aspects of democracy, too. So we have three democracy measures. Uh, one is the broad democracy indicator of quality deficit. That's what most studies have used. Uh, the second is the Freedom House, which we all have heard, you know, their democracy score. And then the third is a more recent measure. There were a couple of political scientists. Uh, what they did was they said that we have so many different measures of democracy floating around. And they all carry different information. Let's combine them into one broad index using uh, some uh, just Bayesian methods. So, and that's what this score is. This is a comprehensive indicator of democracy. They call it the UDI, or Unified Democracy Score. So this is consisting of 10 different democracy measures. So 
like a small group which make their own measure, this measure fits in with the a small group type measure. Um, and then I also look at two different specific aspects in addition to checks and balances. Uh, one is the legislative competitive index. So how competitive the legislature is, which shows how well functioning a democracy is. More com competition, more appropriate the democratic processes in the country. Um, and then second, or thirdly, I look at regime instability. So how quickly is the turnover? We need stable governments to enact stable policies. So this may capture the, the functioning aspect of democracy. Um, and then I look at three, uh, two measures of trade. Typically, it's exports with imports over GDP, which talks about the extent of openness of a country. And then the second measure says that, you know, exchange rate movements should also be factored in our discussion. And this measure looks at exchange rates along with trade, exports, and imports. So it's a more broad-based measure of trade openness. Um, and then these are the three policy measures that dollar and trade use. Black market premium, which captures restrictions the government may have on foreign currency exchanges, which reflects uh, bias against trade. Uh, the second is the size of the government, how big the government is um, uh, in the economy. And then the third one is inflation rate. Inflation rate kind of seems to capture a bunch of microeconomic imperfections that are prevalent in the country. And then for geography, I look at two measures, malaria ecology, which looks at disease environment, uh, which I don't find to be a strong measure. Um, Those SACs in a paper says this is what really matters. We don't find evidence of that measure being as strong. Um, we find that distance from the equator is a better measure of geography, uh, and it's more significant in a bunch of studies, which captures weather, uh, land blockness, etc. Um, now, the model that we look at is typically we are estimating income or economic growth as a function of institutions, trade, and geography, and we add democracy in the mix. Uh, we do a panel data analysis. Panel data lets us have observations over time across countries. So we don't look at just one point in time, we look at 50 years, 1950 to 2010, or 60 years, uh, for more than 120 countries. Um, so we have a pretty broad data set of these variables. And then, like a small group, we model income dynamics. So we allow for past income to affect today's economic growth. So T minus one is past year's income. Um, and then we also allow countries to be different through unobserved features. So new T, new I is country specific, things that we can't observe but we know are different across countries. And then countries may have been moving towards more economic growth over time as well. So that's what this intercept captures. It is common to all countries that looks at uh, the trade movement and income more economic growth. The problem with this model can be that the X's, which are these variables, not only affect income or in economic growth, economic growth may affect them as well. Right? So then we can talk about causation versus correlation. So this technique that I use will help us figure out causation versus correlation. Um, also, not only are these countries different, they may behave differently over time as well. So this is the error for each country over time. And we allow errors to be correlated across different countries. So we allow for heteroscedasticity uh, in the estimation as well. So this model has dynamics. It has endogeneity uh, taken care of. It also has companies to be a lot bit different. Um, and then the approach. Now, typically, when we have endogeneity, when we think that x affects y, but y affects x also. The way to tackle this is to find a new variable that is not affected by y, but that will affect x. Right? So we'll call it w. W becomes the instrument. So what we can do is we can explain how x changes on w and other things and use that here. So what that does is that frees up x from the impact of y. But it lets w 
be a proxy for x, and we can see how will x impact y. Right? So that's what we call the instrumental variable estimation. We're finding ways to proxy for x, which are clear of all the imperfections or feedback of y into it. Um, and the method that we use is a GMM technique. Um, but this GMM technique, as Bazi and Clemens sh have shown, has some problems. We get too many doubles in GMM. Not just a few, but we get too many. When you have too many doubles, you may have having a lot of noise in the estimation. So if you have too many doubles, too many instruments, you may not identify your model correctly. And if you do that, you may get wrong estimates. So that's why they recommended certain tests to check if you have too many doubles or what you can do to fix those doubles. And then, in terms of the improvements in the literature, uh, I think I can move on. Uh, we've modeled endogeneity correctly. We've checked for this. Uh, or do we have too many doubles? If we have, we have fixed those. Uh, we have looked at time dynamics in a more careful manner than what Ace Moglu did. I think they've done, done it more arbitrarily. We are more careful about it. Uh, so our results. First is the basic model uh, with just democracy, institutions, CIM. So just the basic variables, democracy score. The three stars indicate significance at 1%, uh, so highly statistically significant. Two stars will be at 5% and one star will be at 10%. If no stars are not significant. What Basin and Clemens did was they suggested certain tests to see if the model is valid or not. So we want these numbers to be as low as possible, the KP test. Uh, most studies have not reported them. So ours, I think, is the first study following Basin Clemens to pay attention to how we were identifying our model. So what we see here is we have this number more than 05, but this less than 0.05. So we have partial identification, and we can be fine. Most studies that Basin Clemens cited had none of these tests being passed. We have tests passing in one level, not in the other one. Um, and then there are some other first stage diagnostics. This is the model with all these doubles that we can possibly get. This is the model with the least amount of doubles that we need. And this is a hybrid. And based on tests, we find that the hybrid does better than both the extremes. And we will stick with that. So the results that I'll report will be the restricted model. So here we are seeing that uh, past income affects today's income. Uh, now this 0.99 seems like a very big number, but it actually is 1 minus this. Its prediction is 1 minus 0.99. So this shows that there is less feedback. So there's less convergence, or long-term convergence is very slow. Uh, institutions have an impact. So the way to interpret this number is that a 10% improvement in institutional quality will improve economic growth in the long run by 1.6%. So this is the elasticity of institutions on economic growth. So we can actually look at the magnitude and see which one is mattering more. Here, institutions are stronger than trade. Uh, and then democracy is negative, but very insignificant. So the main result is that democracy doesn't really matter as much. Uh, but then this is looking at just the broad democracy score. We have a bunch of other measures. So what do they tell us? So here we have all our democracy measures, uh, one at a time, uh, keeping the same institutional and trade measures and the same geography measures. So across the board, what we see is institutions innovate from They rule supreme. They really do matter for economic growth. And highly significant and quantitatively fairly large. Freedom of democracy as a broad indicator doesn't really matter. UDI, the comprehensive score of 10 underlying measures, not important as well. But then the moment we get into specifics of democracy, Extent of competition in legislature, that is important. Is the government regime stable? So instability has a negative impact, but I means stability is a positive impact. 
Yes, that matters. Are there checks and balances? Yes, that matters too. So if you look at Zimbabwe, for example, they have a democratically elected government. The legislation is not competitive at all. Uh, it's stronghold of Mugabe. Um, no checks and balances. Yes, then we won't see economic growth. And then, of course, we have bad institutions in that country too. And then the extension of the dollar in Cray. So here we look at policy. The fast results said policy doesn't really matter. Uh, and democracy, ambivalent institutions don't matter. So in this specification, what we find is institutions still reign supreme. So that's why number one horse in the horse race, uh, followed by trade, which is also fairly uh, big compared to institutions. Uh, broad democracy variables don't really matter. Specific ones, yes, they matter. On the policy side, black market premium which shows government's aversion to trade, not really as important, but inflation rate, yes, has a negative impact on economic growth, which seems to be intuitive, which some studies were finding by Dolan Cray were saying that that really doesn't matter. Uh, and size of the government also adversely affects economic growth. So big governments will impede economic growth. Um, and then geography as captured by distance from the equator is also important. Um, it, it has a positive end. So further along a country is from the tropics, higher growth environment they have, which we know true from travels and from experiences as well. So uh, to bring it all together, institutions, trade, and geography are important. Institutions reign supreme. Uh, we also find that democracy, if you measure it broadly, it doesn't really matter. Does that mean that democracy is unimportant? No, we're not saying that. We're saying that we're going to look at specific aspects of what democracy plays out in day-to-day -day real life and focus on those things. Uh, maybe those will be more important than just looking at broad overall indicators of democracy. It's too much information in that. It may not uh, convey the right uh, data. Uh, thirdly, we are arguing against um, big governments. Uh, we are saying that. Now, looking at growth government is tricky. In a recession, private sector has a dip in spending. right? Um, so the slack is picked up by government spending. So there may be some endogeneity here. Low economic growth, maybe because of, may result in low government spending or high government spending. What we do is we look at endogeneity. We look at past government spending to model for today's government spending. So we are getting around that causality, uh, correlation issue as well. So we are arguing that, yes, government spending may have a negative impact on growth. This is similar to a finding by Barrow uh, in the 1996 paper. Um, inflation also adversely affects economic growth. Now, why does inflation come about? When government spends uh, too much money, they need to finance that money from somewhere. Right? Either they borrow or the Fed prints money. Uh, if the Fed prints money, money supply goes up, inflation goes up. So inflation may be a result, in a way, of high government spending too. Uh, in a lot of countries, that is the case. You know, when you have high inflation, high spending, they go together. Uh, but interestingly, if you look at the magnitudes, what we find is that trade um, and institutions dominate the adverse impact of um, spending and inflation. So I was chatting with one of my friends yesterday who was saying that, so are we on the low growth path? Uh, probably not, because we see that good institutions will also dominate bad policies and inflation. Uh, hopefully policies are not too much out of the line. Uh, so what do we learn from this? Uh, I think we have two policy implications. For domestic policy, again, we're arguing for restrained spending. What we're not saying is that you just cut all spending. Spending is a much more sensitive matter. Like if you look at political environment, food stamps, and everything is on the table. We should be careful about what we cut, what we don't cut. Uh, and it requires uh, answering some hard questions, not just looking at a hackett or saying that we, all is bad or all is good, but being more proactive identifying what sorts of spending needs to be cut. Because large governments may, in turn, 
after. And a very specific impact on growth. Um, inflation, so the monetary authorities should monitor inflation uh, more closely and they should target it more explicitly. That doesn't get out of hand because that may improve growth. Uh, focus should be on strong institutions. And I think that has implications for US foreign policy as well. We think that if we can establish democracies, our job is done. Uh, but evidence doesn't seem to suggest that. Uh, anecdotally, and also empirically, uh, if we establish democracies, we should also provide capacity to build strong institutions. So we can't just leave countries hanging. Uh, I think this needs to be explored more. How can we uh, enhance decision-making ability in countries? How can we improve the institutions? How can we have them get a better judiciary, a functioning executive, rather than just overthrowing dictators or you know, instituting democratic governments? Because as recent experience shows, that may not be the answer. Egypt, Ukraine, uh, Zimbabwe, for example. Um, and then I've been working on a couple of extensions from this. Uh, institutions do matter. What Chris Moore and I are looking at uh, is do institutions get impacted by terrorism? So we're looking at the role of terrorism on institutions. Will institutions result in, uh, will they be impeded or will they help curtail terrorism? And the second thing I'm looking at is uh, how do people's attitudes uh, help shape institutions at a macro level. So looking at macro behavioral economics, uh, we have data on people's values, what they teach their kids, what they think is important, and we'll see how all these things may impact rule of law, how they may impact um, honoring of contracts on a macro level. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was hoping to have this done also by my semester, but I think I'll go into the summer. Uh, but, um, any questions, thoughts, comments? So a couple quick questions. One is, um, so with your measure of um, geography, which you're looking at distance from the equator, one of the things that occurs to me you might want to look into is um, that, so that could be about geography, but I'm, I'm thinking I'm just sort of trying to roughly visualize in my head the countries near the equator, right? It could also be a story about post-colonialism, right? Because a lot of those countries are former colonies, and a lot of the, the places that did the colonizing are well north of the equator, right, as we know. So, so that could be capturing colonial effects as well as geography. So it's maybe something to keep in mind. The other thing that sort of concerns me with the, the measures is, is stability of tenure, is that really a story about democracy? Because as your opening examples point out, you can have a certain level of democracy in the sense that you're holding elections and they're reasonably free and fair, but have really unstable countries. And the flip side is also true. You can have dictatorships that are, you know, they're not nice in terms of rights and, you know, the way, the way they treat their citizens, but they're pretty stable in economic terms, right? And so I just wonder if stability of tenure, is that really about democracy or is that more what Sam Huntington would have said, what matters is not the kind of government you have, but the degree of government. Yes, I think I'm predicting towards that, that maybe a stable regime may do better than an unstable democracy. Mm -hmm. And then one of my other papers was looking at colonial origins, uh, so legal origins of countries, that was just IDGP. So we can factor that in, in a different set. Some of the uh, variables that you reported are statistically significant, but in terms of the magnitude, they were very small. Yes. And I'm not clear about the unit of measurements and how do you, how do you uh, make sense out of this? Logs. There are logs. That means elasticity. So they are unitless. Okay. Yeah. So how would you interpret, let's say if you take a smallest one in terms of the magnitude, Okay. how would you interpret that like 0 0.03? Sure. So let's say 0 0.024. So this, this is elasticity of inflation to long-term growth. So for a 10% increase in inflation, uh, or for a 100% increase in inflation, economic growth dips by 2%. So elasticity of inflation to long-term economic growth. So inflation so, has to go up by 100% in order to see the... Or 10%, you know, it's elasticity, so you can take 10%, 1%, 100%, so the way you need it. But this is looking at the responsiveness of long-term growth to these log variables. So all these actually are measurable, and that's why I concluded that the impact of this and this dominates these. Because they're all in the logs. They can be compared directly. And that's one of the advantages of our study. We are 
offering comparison quantitative of these variables. One of the very just quick comment for um, something you might want to look at going forward is um, Jeff Herbst did a 2000 book called States in Power in Africa, which develops this ge geographic argument more. And so if you haven't had a chance to look at that, you might um, find that useful. Because it, it basically, I mean, it goes along with, with what you're saying about sort of the impact of geography. And he takes geography really seriously so, mm -hmm. in the African context. The other thing that might be of interest if you're going to do more studies measuring mm -hmm. democracy is um, one of my professors at Notre Dame was working with a huge team of American and um, European political scientists. His name is Michael Coppage, but there's others. And they're working on coming up with a better unit of democracy because they found the same frustrations yeah. you do, which is that freedom, house, and quality, as it turns out, are not actually very mm -hmm. good mm -hmm. ways to measure democracy. They basically have been the best we've had, but that's not saying much, right? So they're trying to do better. And that's still a work in progress. It's not available yet, but you know, might look for that coming out in the next couple of years. Right. That might be better measures. So awesome. yeah. we're trying to do a better job of Yeah, science. because overall measures just have so much noise in it, even yeah. with our survey base. Yeah. But, uh, right. Right. And then the score tried to get around that, but still has the yeah. same problem. Yeah. And so does SMO Goose paper, which is the catch of democracy scores. Right. No. Okay. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it.